Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stu again, and this is Stu's News, a review of American High Speed Rail happenings over the past month. In this February 2024 episode, we'll take a look at what went down in January. Some unexpected competition for Top Story of the Month, but I picked Acela and the NEC. Of late, we've been talking about difficulties with the new Alstom Avelia Liberties that Amtrak is trying to get into service on Acela routes, replacing the current aging Acela Express equipment. However, the New York Times reported that problems with required computer modeling have been resolved and that the new trains are approved to begin dynamic testing. This means that the current revised schedule of these trains in service around October of this year may hold after all. We'll keep an eye on the progress of these new train sets as the year continues. In other NEC news, Amtrak announced the start of construction on the renovation of the William H. Gray III 30th Street Station in Philadelphia. This is a $550 million project aiming at improving retail and hospitality within the station, as well as landscaping without and a modernizing of Amtrak's corporate offices there. Work will occur in several phases and is expected to be complete at the end of 2027. Speaking of Amtrak, let's look at the NEC numbers for November fiscal year 2024. The seller service was about flat compared to October, Keep in mind, these reports run two months behind. However, NEC Regional bounced back big time. Year over year, improvements were across the board. Revenue was up on the NEC by 14%, with operating profit up 15%. Acela profit was the big winner, up 16% over the same time period last year. Now let's move on to California High Speed Rail and another big story. Brian Kelly, the California High Speed Rail CEO, has put in his letter of resignation. Brian Kelly was brought on in 2018 to help turn around the flagging project. It can be argued that the ship has been righted to a degree under his leadership. However, there is still a long way to go. Kelly plans to stay on until a proper replacement is found. What will the result be of changing horses midstream? Will Kelly's successor be able to handle the pressure of heading a project that has ballooned past $100 billion and could be decades late? Time will tell. The California High Speed Rail Authority announced a short list of two teams for their train set procurement process. No surprises here, Alstom and Siemens. The most likely contenders from these companies a variant of the Alstom Avelia, similar to the train set now testing on the NEC, but higher power and possibly without tilting capabilities. From Siemens, it looks to be the American Pioneer 220 being marketed to Brightline West or a similar variant. Although given the short time frame, it may be a product that isn't in the design phase like the Velaro. The authority wants these trains for testing before 2029. On the subject of train sets, the authority revealed some new renders of interior concepts. Four tiers of seating from coach to absurd, or in California high-speed rail speak, flex, comfort, premium, and cocoon. They're also floating the idea of a family area complete with playground. Looks like a party car for kids if you ask me. LA County Metro revealed some value engineering updates to the LA Union Station Link US project. Previous plans have four electrified through tracks at the station continuing west over US 101 before merging down to two tracks and then finally merging into the right of way heading south to Anaheim. This change merges those four tracks down to two before crossing the freeway and then down to one before merging into the right of way. Not a big deal, it just means two California high-speed rail trains won't be able to leave and or arrive the station to or from the south simultaneously. Service to Anaheim may end up reduced anyway due to possible compromises with grade separation and the number of tracks in the Anaheim area. In December, we talked about Network Rail Consulting being considered for an engineering service contract that was approved during the December Board of Directors meeting. Let's hope HS2's luck doesn't rub off. At the January Board of Directors meeting, we got a preview of the anticipated 2024 business plan. The biggest takeaways? 
Merced to Bakersfield projected cost is holding firm with greater risk from CP's 2-3 due to flooding last year and some fiscal uncertainties. Phase 1 cost is expected to rise again after the Palmdale to Burbank and LA to Anaheim environmental impact statements are completed this year and next year respectively. Palmdale Burbank will be the bigger impact because that's the more expensive section. They're predicting base cost will remain in the current range of $89 to $128 billion. No word on a definitive completion date for that though. Preliminary ridership forecast updates have Central Valley and Central Valley to Silicon Valley projections up and overall phase one down 10%. We'll have to wait a few months to see how that works. We also get to see what remains unfunded between Merced and Bakersfield. That would be the Madera to Merced portion, the Bakersfield station and a short section of track leading to it and a second track along the entire 171 mile section. Everything else is covered. That Merced extension is projected at three or $4 billion and it's realistic to say they still need to find at least $5 billion in the next five years to start operations inside their desired 2030 to 2033 range. That also depends on how well construction goes, which leads us into the finance and audit committee reports for November. Capital outlay budget summary, $186 million expended for November, which is much higher than forecast, but about 75 million of that is from change orders because specific tasks have become more expensive for various reasons. Keep in mind, these reports run two months behind as well. December is currently predicted at $139 million, which is close to budget. Construction labor force still increasing, but again, we're waiting for that to be reflected in results as no guideway was completed. Only one structure completed with two new structures started. Also looks like things picked up in December. CP1 earned value chart slightly behind schedule with schedule performance at 0.99, 1.00 indicating on schedule. Still plenty of time to turn that around, but we need the time of being behind on painfully slow schedules to be over. Also CP1 right of way parcel delivery running a little behind. Hopefully that can be rectified quickly and delays can be avoided. CP4 still not done. You can see here that was supposed to be complete in August of last year now forecast to be substantially complete in January 2024, minus the part that isn't substantially complete, which should be done by March. We'll say goodbye to California High Speed Rail, but not California, shifting gears to the High Desert Corridor. This is a planned High Speed Rail corridor between Palmdale and Victorville in Southern California's High Desert that would link the California High Speed Rail and Brightline West corridors. The project received $8 million from the California State Transportation Agency. This was matched by $8 million from LA County Metro. This combined with federal corridor ID funds and similar match gives the HDC Joint Powers Authority $17 million to work with on their corridor ID service development plan, beginning the environmental review process and getting the project to a 30% design state. This puts the 50 mile project two or three years behind Brightline West in that process. Speaking of Brightline West, the company has started field work in the Nevada right of way. Don't get too excited. This is preliminary work like surveying and geotechnical studies necessary to move from a 30% design state to the 100% design state that would enable construction. This preliminary work is expected to take place at the end of January and through February of 2024. No sign of construction anywhere yet. Expect that in another five or six months. Same for field work in California now taking place between Barstow and the California Nevada state line. It has also recently been revealed that the Department of Transportation approved $2.5 billion in private activity bonds for the project. This combined with previously approved bonds and the recent federal state partnership for intercity passenger rail $3 billion grant award 
means Brightline West should be half funded by the middle of this year, 2024. Last month, we talked about the Buy American waiver request by Nevada Department of Transportation to allow importation of high-speed rail train and control system components to facilitate Brightline West, similar to one Amtrak received for the Alstom train sets in 2014. This month saw a flurry of comments on the waiver's Federal Register page, including heavy lobbying by Alstom and affiliated entities. In dispute is whether or not anything needs to be imported, so it should be interesting to see how that plays out. Wrapping up the West Coast, we once again find ourselves immersed in Cascadia high-speed rail. Former Secretary of Transportation Ray LaHood and several other prominent politicians spoke at an Oregon Legislative Joint Committee on Transportation urging consideration of the Cascadia High-Speed Rail project. Reaction in the meeting was mixed, reflecting the general attitude of the region where the debate is between finding a way to study and fund the potentially $50 billion high-speed rail project or spend less money improving the existing much slower Amtrak Cascade service. By the way, Amtrak Cascade's doing pretty well this year, one of the only Amtrak state-supported routes turning an operating profit, with ridership this fiscal year up almost 60% over last year, carrying roughly 65,000 passengers a month. Moving from the West Coast to approximately the Gulf Coast and Dallas-Fort Worth high-speed transportation. Recently, the Dallas Transportation and Infrastructure Committee met among the topics, the downtown area and its interaction with both DFW HST and Texas Central. Last month, we talked about a Dallas councilwoman demanding that a high-speed station in Dallas be underground. This month, things are a little more open-minded with discussion of a possible elevated covered walkway between Dallas Union Station, the convention center, and a high-speed rail station. Such a walkway would be three quarters of a mile in length. Hopefully it's like one of those at the airport. Also Gulf Coast adjacent, Brightline Florida's extension to Tampa. A measure was introduced to the Florida legislature to set aside a 44 foot wide portion of the Interstate 4 corridor between Tampa and Orlando, obviously aimed at facilitating Brightline's eventual 85 mile expansion between the two areas. Also in this article, we again see a mention of 150 mile per hour speeds in service. Urban legend or potential reality? You decide. And now it's time for Stu's Boo Boo's, where we go over everything I missed last month. The only boo boo we have is a subject we already covered, the $8 million of CalSTA funding for the High Desert Corridor. I missed it, but you all missed it too, so you lose a gold star. That brings you down from a big 10 star to nine little ones. However, because I missed that as well, no silver stars for me. Total on those is still a paltry one. As always, if you find a boo-boo in this presentation or come across something I missed, let me know in the comments. If it's a good one, you win a prize. A special thanks to the Lucid Group as always for their contributions to this presentation. If you'd like to join our Motley crew, check out the invite in the description. Up next in the High Speed Rail Corridor series is a video about various ideas for speeding up the Northeast Corridor. Look for that next week. More city pair videos, which I hope to start incorporating 3D visualization into. And of course, another Stu's news on the last Friday of next month. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you on that big, beautiful freeway.